Okay, I will uh, get started. Okay, welcome to my talk. Um, I'm going to share my experience about like, uh, how I build um, a large scale analytics service with Postgres on Azure. Um, in my talk, I would have two parts. So the first part is going to cover the use case and uh, how I use the CIDUS and the, and the Postgres to, I mean, for the service. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to uh, talk about why I'm using CIDUS and Postgres, right? Because um, in, in particular, these days, if you come in from West Coast, from Silicon Valley, there's many other gene choices to build a larger scale analytics and services. And I will conclude the talk with some uh, like discussions on how like, a Postgres can be, like I say, improved to make it better as, uh, for the like, building analytics and services. Okay, now it's on my use case. I'm a database engineer working in the Microsoft Core OS group. So, so the Windows, I mean, so Core OS, now we have like Azure, like Linux, and we have Windows, but, uh, um, but Windows is still the predominant like, business for like, Microsoft. It's a, it's a huge like, business. Um, so Windows has been deployed on over 800 million like, devices. Um, so the, and, and the Windows itself is also a very like, sophisticated like, system. It's been heavily instrumented. So um, just on a rough count, it's have over 100K type of like, events um, being fired I mean, at a different stage of the Windows like, operation. Um, so the, the, the data being generated from like, all the, say, like devices and being put onto the Azure cloud is measured in a few like, petabytes per day. Right? In order to understand the data, we, we need to stitch those events actually like, together to, to make sense of it, to like, understand what, what the user experience is going to like, look like and what the reliability of the system is. Um, say, I mean, like a, as I said, so like Windows being heavily like, instrumented, so every logon, Wi-Fi connections, like Bluetooth connections, is been, all being like instrumented. So an example of the measure data is say if you click on a startup like, menu, so the so launch time of the startup uh, menu is from two events. From the, you click on the start menu and to the start menu actually launch. Right. So this latency turned out is quite important for the I mean for like most of the user experience and also being affected by the hardware quite a lot, right? In the new hardware for, I mean, with high-end SSDs, so it's come up at very quickly. In some older, um, say, hard drive-based like, hardware, I mean, there's still quite a, a lot of people running like Windows on the old the generation of machines. It's become, say, slower. So we're looking for ways how to, uh, to make the, say, the, uh, the overall Windows experience uh, better. So the major data, is created from the event data. So it's much smaller. Um, it's, it's about like five terabytes per day. And uh, so at like a monthly, can say like a give or take about 150 to 200 terabytes like a, per month. Um, so all those measured data is being collected to serve, um, we call it the executive decision dashboard. Um, because of the size of the windows, I mean, I mean the business itself. So this is the most important dashboard for like Microsoft. Right? I mean, this dashboard is used to decide if a Windows update is actually ready for the customers. So as such, there are thousands of monthly internal user for this. I, I mean, a lot of people, the whole job is trying to improve the metric in being shown on the like, dashboard. And uh, there's hundreds of like dashboard pages, and as a, say the result, there's about like six million queries being generated per day from those like dashboard pages. Um, a, a few months ago, there's a public disclosure of the, this actually like system, and I just have this like blog link. So for some of the details, you can you can um, feel free to actually read. Um, as I said. Um, Currently, most of the measures coming from the telemetry event, 
and uh, I mean, there are more and more measures is coming, is being generated from the machine, machine learning algorithms. But because this is such an important system for Microsoft like business, and uh, for the past six years, they have multiple, um, like, so that, that, I mean, multiple like, solutions being built. So that, uh, uh, the, so the generation one was built about five years ago. It's actually using the sharded SQL row store. One thing sharded because there is no distributed query involved. So it's a bunch of SQL servers, and uh, so the application had to write a proxy to do the query find out, and uh, like, so like merge them actually because it's kind of like the Postgres, like, uh, like a foreign like a data wrapper. And uh, this system in operation for about, I say a year and a half, and then it's running out of steam. So the second generation system was built. It's also, I mean, so it changed from row store into the column store, right? Um, I think um, five to six months after this, the system get built, and, and because Microsoft have a lot of people passionately working on database and tech, there is, um, I guess, a mature like distributed column store tech being built. Um, and uh, it's comp I mean, I'm going to kind of talk about the CNH a little bit, but uh, surface to say that um, that's the second generation, I mean, I worked for about, say, another year and a half. Um, so then I was actually brought in to, to look at it, to building the third generation because uh, the second generation was about to actually run in out of like a steam. Um, why I, I first to join the effort, I analyze why the first two actually generation failed, right? Um, so the number one reason, well, because it's an entity service, the curve of the dimensionality is actually real. Uh, and uh, one of the issue uh, uh, in the first two like in generation is it requires a separate like a large scale map reduce like processing to producing the cubes right because uh, I mean the the use case is to like, to light up say the dashboard right so I mean because of the dimensionality and uh, they take longer and longer time to prepare those edge cubes and uh, also the data is quite highly skewed. So those are badge job quite often would just randomly failed just somewhere because of the, like memory and or other type of resources. And uh, each fail would have causing the job to be say, a rerun, which is in, impacting the SLA, right? Because when people make a decision next day, they want to, as much like, data as possible. Um, so the second issue is more related to the sharded like SQL type of like solution because there's, there's no true like distributed SQL support um, because of the the like data complexity and the calculation complexity is an increase over the years. Um, in one case I've seen is a single query is like using a dynamically generated uh, SQL. It's about 500 KB, just kind of get, is mind-boggling to how to actually debug in those kind of scripts, right? I mean, it's it takes longer and longer to introduce in new calculation types because of like, this actually data complexity. And uh, the third reason, so um, it's like I said, because say the like a distributed column store, like does not have the dimensionality problem, and uh, it's it's also relatively concise to actually express like um, say different calculation types. That one problem with that is cannot drive decision like a dashboard for the concurrent queries. Um, I'm going to cover some, some of the reasons in a later slides. So because of this, these three main reasons, so I had to come up with a, a totally new like design. Yes. Um, in this such a new like design, so there's like three main pieces. One is I call it measure data lake. I mean, so you can think about it is it's kind of like I said, the Kafka queue, right? So, and, and in fact, um, when I started, it is a Kafka queue. 
and because I'm on the Azure cloud, I have put, I put the Kafka queue on the Azure blob storage. Um, as, I, as the data actually grows, and uh, uh, then the, the total cost actually doesn't make sense anymore, right? Because like I said, the Kafka just in cost is getting, getting more and more expensive. And then I realized, well, I don't really need is actually the storage under the cover. I do not need a Kafka lifestyle or the API. So basically we just, I took out the Kafka layer and just using the so Azure like blob storage like natively. So this is a, as an integration queue to receive the, uh, the measure data generating from the, uh, the upstream because we still need a, say, the, as this a batch processing layer to like, stitch those events like, together and enrich those events. And uh, since it's a reporting like, system mostly, then I, have, I do have a fairly like, sophisticated like, data access service, and, and I would not um, cover much like, in this talk. And uh, now, I mean, the elephant in the diagram is like, a status Postgres cluster. Um, so as part of the design, I should fold um, this like, data like, preparation, I mean, kind of a large scale like, map reducing job into the, the CIDAS the Postgres cluster itself. Right? So that's why I drew, um, pick a photo of the, of about this like, like, say, like, iceberg, right? Because there's, like, so CIDAS help to actually extract a lot of complexity. Um, so the one added advantage with this approach is also unified the real-time and the historical query path, right? Because there is no more, uh, so actually Lambda architecture, which is for whatever reason getting very popular for analytics like services. Um, so here's some of the details about the like, database cluster itself. Um, I'm on the CIDAS Enterprise uh, and the Postgres 11.3, um, as you see, I tried, I'm fairly up to date, right? So, so the thing is, uh, I actually need every improvement from a Postgres, even from minor releases, to gain the performance edge. Because, I mean, the performance means like a cost edge reduction, right? Um, so I started this like project about like two years ago, I think. So the CIDAS around time was shipping like 7.0 and uh, and also the Postgres 10.0 just as released. Or to put it in another way, if there's no CIDAS 7.0 or Postgres 10, because on a, a, to have those like partition, like declarative partition table support, I would have used a, a different like solution than like say the Postgres based. Um, so some minor like details about the, uh, say the production class itself, it has over like 28, 100 cores, have 18 terabytes of memory, and the country is it's about one petabyte of the disk space. And uh, this is keep on like uh, actually growing. So I have to like uh, do, do uh, some sampling to suppress people's like, data to make sure they, they really need. Um, I think probably by the end of the year, this, like, this space will be actually doubled. And uh, so like data-wise, um, this cluster is hosting about like 20,000 like measures. Think about each big measure is like a multi-month time series like data. Um, so the new data coming is about like five like terabytes of like data per day. And uh, thanks to the GDPR requirement, is also need to delete five terabytes I mean, like five terabytes like data per day because of, um, I mean, this is actually creating some additional like challenges for some other type of like system. Um, I'm gonna talk about, I have two main type of query, and one is a little bit cheaper, the other is actually more expensive. So the so cheaper one, the P75's like query latency is about, is actually less than like, like uh, say like 90 millisecond. And uh, for the more expensive one, it's about like 200, like, uh, 200 milliseconds. Of course, like uh, for uh, such a large scale system, we uh, oftentimes need to support, like I say, some of the data science workloads, stuff like that. We, from the front door query, we do allow, like I say, say four minutes 
up to actually four minutes to actually queries. And uh, so actually people can do a fairly less, like a sophisticated uh, say analysis with the data. And uh, if you need something longer than that, so like we have like backdoor, right? So I mean, we can make the job to running up for up to two hours. And this is how I set the lock time out because, like a, because we do not want to say job running for tens of hours. And, and this is a way, I mean, so this also forces people think about how to like a, so partition and a slice and dice say the data, right? So in, into more like manageable chunks. And in fact, this is approach we use internally for the for our own like map reducing job, right? Just like a it's a measure that kind of like the fish from the sea, it's come in all shape and sizes, right? This is a let's say the photo of the like Tokyo fish market. So I, I mean, since there, um, I mean, the country there are about ten types of the schema and uh, the different uh, types that keep on coming in. So in order to make the like, processing job sane, right, um, to try to manage the complexity, so this is a perfect case to like, using like JSON. Um, so as you can see in the slides, I have a like, JSON B column. And uh, one advantage of like, using JSON is also to allow have per measure like schemas, right? So because they have come, come special like dimension these days, because like a, uh, and, and uh, I mean it's, it's quite uh, goofy to to, uh, to a large extent. And uh, this schema has two timestamp. Uh, so the streaming time, uh, the stream timestamp is actually say the processing time. So it, I mean it's the current hour, so it'll be the current time. Um, so the Windows measure data has one feature is like I say the data could be always actually delayed, right? So if you have a, a laptop, you use it before the, the telemetry get uploaded. So people just close their laptop and like, say on vacation or I mean so simply it's let's say like long weekend. So the data could be delayed for a couple of days, sometimes to a couple of weeks. Um, I think just as a business logic, so we actually allow the data up to say uh, say like 15 days like like a delay, and uh, this table also has a hash partition key. Like uh, I mean, it's used by CIDUS to do the hash like partitioning, and it can um, partition the data say relatively evenly, uh, so like over a, a cluster. And then and also using the native Postgres partition to do the, say the processing on the event time. So this is allow us to do that's like table dropping, right? Because otherwise you have to, I mean, just delete the rows is not going to actually cut it. So the data is coming like mostly on, on the hourly like basis. And we have some newer data now coming at the minute, like a time grain now. Um, I just also want to have one word about uh, say the ingester program. Originally, I saw that I need probably a small cluster to, like, to read in terabytes of like data per day. And uh, like I uh, say, say shredded and, uh, and then so through the side us and copy into those like a Postgres edge workers. And, and, turn, and then I just thought, hey, what if I just write a simple like a Go program, multi-threaded Go program to do the same thing? Well, it turned out, well, we had to ship it in actually like production. Uh, it's been used for almost like two years. And uh, it's actually very impressive to see that the heap can go to, say, uh, so at least 100 uh, like, uh, gigabytes, and it can run for months I mean, without it stopping. So, so it's actually kudos to the uh, Go like VM team. OK, so after the data get ingested, so I'm going to, to have, like, say, uh, say, a lot of fish, a uh, metaphor here. Um, as a, Say the typical say the sushi chef before they serve the sushi, they need to prepare the fish into some like more like manageable say cut it into like manageable chunks, right? Well, in my case, my knife is like is such a side as distributed upstairs statement, right? I mean it's just a, a say vanilla Postgres upstairs statement, and it's just a side as actually um, enhanced so it work 
in, a, in a, like I say, like a distributed fashion. Um, there's two ways to cut the data, right? So one is, say the reporting table is share the hash partition key as, say, original incoming like a measure table. So it's like co-located. So when you do this kind of cutting, uh, there is no internal traffic. So it's actually fairly efficient. So uh, and, and everything was done in parallel on each of the worker nodes. And uh, of course, this is not always the case. I mean, we do have fairly rich uh, report, and uh, then we need to pick a different like, partition key. In this case, the data will go through this side-to-side uh, -side coordinator and get reshuffled to the, uh, to the worker node again. Because like, uh, on Azure, we have like a 40 gigabit as a network, so it's, the whole thing was, I mean, very efficient. So the algorithm-wise is, you can think so like logically, and it's about one billion rows, right? So like every hour, we have about one like billion rows. And we partition it into like 15 day like buckets, right? And then we just parallel insert into the 15 days. Right, so because we have different kinds of, say, reporting tables, say, I just pick some random number here, like a 10, I think we are actually over 10 kinds of reports now. So you can think about it as almost, on this cluster, it's had every hour have 150 jobs to do this massive updates, right? And it's a serving query at the same time. So it's, I mean, it's actually fairly like, impressive so the, so the Postgres along with, the, let's say, like Citus can do this. And uh, so each of the like, daily table, um, you see the reporting table, has been heavily like, indexed. Right? So some of the like, daily table has over like 50 like, indexes. And I do use partial covering index a lot. And uh, this would uh, say, allow me to the index only scan. So this is the case I'm trading this space for the like, performance. Right? So in, an, uh, in a cloud environment, even though the CPU performance is not improving much year over year anymore, there's still lots of room for the, the, the disk space and like, networking. So with all that work, we actually finally to like, ready to serve, uh, like, say, the queries. Um, so on this side, I show there are two types of query. The first one, just a vanilla group by query, right? Um, it's, I mean, so the, in this particular example I show is how we calculate the averages. And uh, this query would get more complicated when we need to calculate seems like I say like a percentile, because in this case, instead of a simple sum and count, I'm getting, getting an array of a sum and count, right? So, so basically, you, I mean, I have to write the code to uh, leverage, uh, say, features from Azure to do those uh, distributed, uh, say, like uh, computations. And then, uh, fairly like recently, we also had a histogram like data types coming in. Um, and also the dimension columns is getting more complicated. So originally we started with scalar columns like a integer strings. Now we have things like a, say arrays, like a, say, uh, say a list of the experimentation IDs and the stuff like that, right? So, and, and then, so the, so the first type of query, even first type of query getting fairly actually complicated. Um, so, so think about the first type of query do the average calculation. Right, because um, I mean, statistically it has one problem. It's actually subject to the outlier. I mean, it's actually biased. The, the metric value will be biased to the outlier. So um, in some cases, like, uh, because it's, like, we have such a huge like, population, a lot of the devices come in various test labs, right? So some test lab in so southern Taiwan could be rebooting the machine 10,000 times a day, right? So if you Want to count in machine say, reliabilities? Well, this one at the outlier would totally uh, say, like, skew, uh, you know, uh, say, a metric and would create an alarm. I mean, on the dashboard to say, well, there's something wrong because the machines seem to be constantly, like, say, rebooting. 
to, there's a, a couple of different ways to tackle this kind of, say, like statistical uh, like anomalies. One is, of course, you can use machine learning. Well, the, the problem with using machine learning is you have to know the like, distribution, right? Because we have 20,000 measures, so you have to know, like, say, like distribution for each other measure. And uh, also, the user behavior changes all the time. So you have to keep up with understanding, OK, what the distribution are. Um, well, clearly, this is not a very, like, say, like scalable. So, the, uh, so the, this is the, say, the second type of query coming in. Second type of query, I mean, um, from the statistical point of view, is actually um, like a population, like, like distribution agnostic. So the way to achieve that is, is introducing an inner query, right? So the first one is group by of the, say, take an average, for example, you group by the device ID. You calculate per device level average. Then you calculate the average across all like devices. So to some extent, like this query, internally we call it one device as one vote, right? Um, because this query itself does not have any of the like, data assumption. So, um, it's, so it can be applied to any kind of, say, like, like a measure. So I want to like, talk, pause the scene for a second. So the device ID, as I mentioned, is 800 million, right? So this inner query, the fact that like group by 800, potentially 800 million like device IDs. And uh, I think when I sign up, I mean, with the team to do this, this is actually the query I look at. So I do not know Citus, I do not know Postgres. I, um, I, I was just looking for a way how to actually speed up this query, right? Because like, this is also the query killed the, the first two like, generation of the like, solutions. Well, I just, so I, here's some of the, my um, findings and, uh, and some of them done by my uh, colleagues because Microsoft is a, is a, like a pretty a big company. There's a lot of people um, in a similar like, like space. Um, I think because of the data warehouse and, and analytics service, it's not really a new problem, right? Especially for the past four or five years, there's many, many like solutions being like in town, right? So even Apache has quite a few like projects, right? So the Keyling is from eBay. I mean, it's doing the, mostly doing the static cubing. I think recently they have a way to do introducing the Lambda architecture to the in-memory and the static cubing like together. P Node is a, a project from uh, Linking. Now it's also part of Microsoft. The, in fact, I worked with a P Node engineer for about two months to see kind of whether they can handle that particular query type. And then we have things like a Druid and um, quite recently because uh, Databricks and Spark has become a first class like Citadel on Azure. So there are some teams who want to try those kind of queries on the Spark Azure cluster. Um, so I've been like, uh, looking through and evaluating these Azure solutions. Uh, so here's a sub list of the issues I've seen. One is like even though everyone calls themselves like SQL engines and, and stuff like that, and I mean they're not really true kind of mature SQL engine compared with um, the engines like a, I mean from like uh, say like DBMS, right? So say take Pnode for example, it cannot even do that uh, say the inner like subquery. So I let alone to the hard cardinality one because the hard cardinality would have an issue that you won't have enough. Like, so at the memory, then you have to spill things on the disk, and uh, I mean the data could be actually skewed, and then you have to handle that too. So, right? so is that you, uh, so I mean that query looks very innocent, but it turned out to be a really hard query to tame. Um, and and then of course like uh, um, I mean with new dimension types like arrays and stuff like that. I mean. Most of the solutions, um, I mean, existing like open source like solutions from Apache, like just, I mean, cannot even touch it. Um, also, I, I noticed like most of the, um, say, recent like analytics service all using col column store of some sort. 
right? Um, I would say it's almost like a, uh, I mean, they depending too much on the column store, I could say they're using scanning um, because JSON data type, I mean, have per row kind of say a schema is getting quite like a popular. I mean, kind of whether we as a data guy, we like it or not, right? So for Windows major data, those are JSON typically embedded something called like, a, so those are GUID types, which is just horrible for any column storage compression, right? Um, I say that because I saw many column store, I evaluated many, say, uh, column stores. And uh, since then, since they cannot compress much, and then they have to do a lot of like scanning, and uh, then when you have a few concurrent query come in, well, one, one thing we realize, even four or five concurrent query just suck away the system memory bandwidth of a physical machine or a VM, right? So once the system memory bandwidth gets sucked away, the machine's dead. Once a few machines are dead, the, the whole cluster just I mean, becomes a very unresponsive. And uh, the, kind of the other thing, just from the say the uh, production experience, is quite often I realized we do need updates, right? Um, for the final side production experience now, for almost once or twice every two to three months. I really need update because they're from upstream, people have a bug and then people give me the wrong data, right? And so causing the production issue, give me the billions of billions of rows are wrong data because I mean, um, okay, so either we kind of fix, say the service, right? So you have to patch up to figure which time range is special patch, say the service with the business logic. I mean, if we bring down that, um, that means, first of all, you have to code it. Second is you have to have like a downtime. Right, because like you have to like swap in, say, a new service, and of course you have no idea why you need to like swap out. Um, so the cheaper solution is actually update data, right? So, I mean, um, with Citus and Postgres, really take, I mean, for the few cases I encountered, take about one hour to update like, two to three like, billion rows, and uh, so the outage is kind of more or less. So it lasts for about one to two hours, so like, like, which is okay. And uh, I think because of the modern, uh, the new an analytics server being built, they always have some, again, I call it, I say the like, uh, accidental complexities, right? So you you need Hive and Spark and cluster to prepare the data. You also need to, I mean, even a cloud environment because it's, it's tied into HBase. I mean, in this case, like I say, like a kidding, and uh, you have to set up on your own, like HDFS, it's kind of why, right? Because these things are designed for bare metal like, system, then it makes much sense to have to run in a cloud environment, right? And uh, quite often for like a, for the database people that, I mean, then we need to run like a zookeeper. So and I, uh, in my previous role, when I'm working for the Bing infrastructure team, I do, have a team kind of working for me to maintain, to keep the zookeeper up. Um, it turned out it's actually not that easy. So um, basically this time around, I say, okay, I'm just going, going full at your cloud like a native and, uh, and just use the fabric features and, and without, like, uh, say, I mean, so using like zookeeper or ETCD, those kind of things. Okay, now I just, uh, it's close to the, to the end of my, Talk, right? So if the Postgres and Citus and solution sounds so great, I know why a lot of people, I mean, if especially start from new, I mean, Postgres probably is not going to be your first choice to build an analytics, large scale analytics service, right? The people would probably <coughs> most likely pick Druid. Like I say, I think even Airbnb is actually picking something like Druid. Um, I think there's, I've been actually thinking about this for some time. Um, I, think I, I, so I would say like a, the, um, the Postgres SQL and the, or SQL in general is marketed towards like DBAs, right? It's not really marketed towards like your programmers. So if you're a real programmer, you write procedural code in an old language called Java and Scala, right? So you suck the data out, you 
do a bunch of processing, and you I mean, write say the say the data back in. Um, so the so SQL itself, I mean, it's in particular the Postgres SQL is actually very powerful. Um, but the like a declarative programming is is kind of unnatural for a lot of people. I mean, it's so it uh, takes time to like practice. So so this is some of the slides. I mean, some of the points I have summarized like, uh, over the past two years. So to compare with a normal like, procedure like program, right? So the first thing you need to come up with is like data structure. Well, in SQL, that data structure is called table, right? But of course, designing a table is not easy because sometimes you had to, quite often you had to think about the indexing, right? And uh, also because the table could be huge, right? It could be have say billions, hundreds of billions of rows, and then you have to think about how do you actually partition this data like properly, right? And, uh, and the other thing is very often, even we use it internally, right, you have to, quite often you have to scan the entire range, all the data in that range, right? Postgres doesn't really have a particular efficient way for you to do the paging, and uh, then it's basically you have to write your own custom paging, so it works out fairly well, but if you know what you're actually like doing, right? If you do not know what you're doing, then you're spending like a, the job can run just for hours. Uh, I mean, it's just a very slow like performance, right? And, and the second thing is uh, about this algorithm like design. So SQL lets you think the problem like differently, right? So you, um, and in particular with the CIDAS, you have to think about also how, how the data get to move I mean, so like among the nodes, right? Because you want to um, improve the I/O efficiencies. So this kind of like a programming sometimes is not easy, right? So um, say for example, because of um, because you're using CIDAS as like a distributed SQL, so all the I mean, even the percentile the building percentile function doesn't work anymore, right? So basically, you have to think about uh, ways to like, implement it. So for the past two years, I personally implemented like three different edge versions and uh, tried to fit in into the three uh, different types of the, say, the, say like, uh, like, uh, uh, like a data characteristic that's actually different, right? So sometimes you have to make certain like trade-offs. And uh, also compared with the like, normal program execution, there is no profilers. I mean, yes, sure, love and uh, learn, I say, explain a lot, right? So. Um, but it, it sometimes it doesn't have enough of the details. Um, so I didn't realize wh why it started. I just said, hey, I just need to grab all the I.O., like low level, OS level, I.O. counters, memory counters, as a connection counter into a SQL table, and then I, I graph it with an, another open source project called like Grafana. And, and it, it can show me almost and when once I start refreshing every five seconds, I can almost have this live view about the system. And uh, what turned out, I built myself a visual like, debugger, right? So, so the, for the past two years, when I, whenever I run queries or adding indexes, I go to my, like say the Azure Grafana like, pages to, to kind of see like, what's happening, right? I mean, this kind of helped me to tune the algorithm to understand the data actually better. Um, I would say the other one is actually watch out for the auto or vacuum. Um, I didn't really pay attention to this about, I mean, until one and a half ago, and I realized like there's small disk kind of leakage, right? So there's always using, I mean, it's, I mean, I calculate, I mean, I do a lot of calculation stuff a lot, so I, I'm actually one of those, say, like a numbers guy. I just, the number just doesn't really actually add up. So why am I using more like, more like a disk space than it should? And, and then turn out, like, well, I need to dive the auto vacuum, because if, if, if the thing cannot keep up, if the auto vacuum worker cannot keep up, um, and, and then so the disk space will just actually grow. Since I have like a daily partition table, it, it'll actually grow for a few hours a day and then stop, right, because it's a switch to the new table. Um, so I, I think this is kind of one of those edge gotchas, I mean, not only say the natural, I mean, if coming from the OO procedural programming in the background. So I will just talk about, say, some of the, say, like, 
potential like suggestion to the Postgres itself. Um, I think the Postgres 11 does have like a runtime partitioning pruning. Uh, what, what I found is the performance has more to be actually desired. So I had a, a create, I had a table. I mean, it's a, it's a six months table, so 180 days. And um, I realized, I mean, even though it's do the runtime partition pruning, the performance is not great, right? So um, it's because like, uh, I want to see if, how can we improve on that. Since I now put a profile to the queries, and then I notice, um, I would say like over 90% of query is hitting this, uh, say, monthly, right? I mean, it's actually, uh, it's, and then I just created a 30-day table, right? I just, I have this space to spare, so I just create a 30-day table to a route a query to the 30-day, most of query to the 30-day table. And it um, turned out it's improved the performance by three times. Um, well, I would I could take that. Um, so the second issue I encountered with a sort of uh, a Postgres is um, because I have to use a PG bouncer, right? Um, there is no built-in connection pool that I managers. So there's two use cases uh, from my point of view. One is to the connection like throttling. So the second use case is since I need to drop those like partitions in a very like, deterministic fashion. So I, if I need to drop the, those partitions, I want to drop it within a minute or two, right? So in this particular case, I have to use a PG bouncer to turn off the select queries coming into those like, tables. And then I just I drop them. Because otherwise, you can always waiting for the lock, right? So, uh, um, so the problem is if the query is not you know, non-stopping coming in with different pattern, then this kind of like, say like maintenance stuff is becoming non like deterministic, right? Um, so I think if having some let's say like building connection pool and manager with some more fine grained of a, so uh, so a, a lock control, it'll it'll help improve those edge maintenance jobs. And uh, I think now I'm just entering more um, say speculative like suggestions. Um, Oh, so on the shared buffer, right? So, so the performance of the Venice is heavily depending on what pages get cached into the shared buffer, right? So, currently, I mean, there's no fine-grained control over the shared buffers, which indexes get like, loaded into the page. Um, in order to so, in order to improve the performance. And also to have I mean, an external view control about that. So we have to wrote a customized warm-up code um, to, like, to like per periodically just rerun a few queries we have seen, and then it's like those like indexes would get in and loaded, right? And, and, the, and the other thing I was always thinking is as the machines getting bigger and bigger, right? So I mean, I mean on a full terabytes like a memory machine probably you can dedicate one terabytes for the shared buffer so the, so the idea is like you would I mean you want certain pages kind of like I say never get a page out so since there is more like CPU to spare so why not take some a code index page just compress them and still <coughs> store them in a DRAM and, and then upon access just had to decompress it um, so I think the Postgres up until now still using this say, volcano style like query processing as, a, as a one vector at a time. And uh, it will, for analytic query, it will be benefiting greatly from a vectorized query processing. Uh, so I talked to a few Postgres committers. This thing is not really high on the list yet. Um, I think the other one is um, because my table right now is has a say, lifetime for about like six months, right? So, I mean, I, I stored all on the premium like storage. So I would, so as I extend, need to extend say into one year and two year in the past, right? So the so the country I have a kind of pretty manual way. So I just dump all the data on disk. Reload it into another table in, in say in another like, table space, which is on a cheaper like storage, right? Um, 
so ideally, there will be kind of a little bit more automated or a better, I'm say more efficient way to do this if this feature is uh, that you're building into this uh, Postgres core to actually allow the partition table to actually switch like table spaces. Uh, so the last point I want to make is um, because the like, distributed query execution, um, I, will, I will say almost, I will say almost I would say mainly stats function in Postgres actually doesn't work. So, um, so kind of you, I mean, just you have to write your own. So I, I was hoping that there will be some, say, standards, uh, say, standardized way of, I mean, say, like doing this, okay? Because I can see a lot of Postgres come up with its own distributed like, query execution, and then none of those like, stats functions are, say, like, portable anymore, right? So I, I think this, um, well, it could be a big problem down the road for analytics workload. Well, I hope I'm on time. So, questions? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, this is a, a very good question. Uh, I'm not sure if I need to re repeat the question. Probably I would just say do now. I mean, how do I uh, say, go protect myself against, say, like data corruption? Um, I think initially I'm, I was fairly uh, confident, right? Because I, I, I only need to maintain, because once I have a device ID, I only need to maintain 30 day table. So I can just drop the table. So I only have one month or you know, five worth of like say like life like, like data. Um, so so the way to protect against that is because I have this like I like say say like a measure like data lake, right? So I can always if data corrupted, I can always re-ingest it. In. Um, now uh, my cluster lifetime for I mean non-device ID based such like data extended to six months. So this do get me. <laughs> quite concerned now, right? Um, so the thing is, there's a, a, a couple of things to uh, imagine to say like doing that. You know, one is, um, I mean, we start to, to do the, uh, say the daily backups, I mean, like in, into the, say the blob storage. Well, it, it's about, like, um, well, I mean, so like incrementally. Right, right, so, so um, well, because, see, the blob storage is actually cheap, right? So I think probably it's probably known that it's about $10,000 per month per petabyte, right? So, I mean, there's, I mean, I, I can just like, blow a lot of money actually on that one. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, assume, uh, okay. So uh, do you get bills for all this? You don't know which. Oh, I, um. All right, so this is a graph for the internal Microsoft. <laughs> um, I'm actually, uh, internal Microsoft team, in particular, say, my, like, uh, in my group, um, we actually pay higher price than the enterprise customer, than a typical enterprise customer. So I had to be much more cost conscious than a typical enterprise customer. And I'm also, because internal customer, we only limited to a few data center. So not all like data center are available to us. So. To answer the question, yes, I have worked harder. <laughs> yes? Well, okay, so, well, as I said, um, the Microsoft SQL Server itself, I mean, it's a standalone like SQL Server, and as um, so as Osgon called out, it's not really like distributed. But uh, Microsoft do have, because we're a big company and a lot of people, smart people working there, so we do have distributed column store too, right? Um, so I think the thing I realize 
because I was a column store at Fanatic, uh, say, say 10 years ago. So um, I think right now, because the data is so rich now, and uh, I mean, it's kind of one trick pony with co column store and just a very narrow column compression is not going to actually cut it anymore. So I mean, the, if people have more wider like data structures, like say like JSON or even arrays, right? So I mean, think about it even for an, say array like data structure. So if I have one billion rows, if we flatten the thing out, so if the array say on average has 10 IDs in there, I mean, just a very scary thought to, to kind of having row explosion like that. Right? So and I think because of this uh, richer uh, data types, it's actually making the traditional like, so, like, so, like, row the, like, database um, um, as, um, I say more attractive. Right? And also, I think one thing did not call, I say, like, like uh, very explicitly, is the event time come in, the timestamp is in milliseconds, right? So sometimes even, say, like, nanoseconds. However, human cannot really understand, I mean, say, like, say like data as the exact kind of time like resolution. So the reporting is usually on a weekly and seven days. So they actually require, say, say the daily grain. So, so the one of the things I did is during those actual aggregation, I truncate the time at the, let's say, like daily grain. So this would actually allow me to massively also compress like data, right? I, I call it like semantic compression. So if, even having higher compression rate than if I just use a row store, right? I mean, sorry, uh, say the column store, because that only has the append only like strategy. And then you still end up with lots and lots of like rows. And for monthly query, there are just tens of billions of rows to be like a um, scan, like per query. Yeah, well, I, I mean, all the cooking are considered actually updates. Well, I, I, I say an updates and the inserts, right? If a new row, you insert it, and, and, and then if you have, say, old rows already with existing key, they actually update them, right? And on, I mean, the other kind of the updates, as I said, like typically, quite often, I mean, like we receive like run data, and we actually need to fix this actual data retroactively, 